We're going to talk about a big, long investigation that has been published in the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, the ICJI.org. Is it a commercial thing, the ICIJ? No, as far as I understand, it's it, it's it's a non-profit, and, but it relies on uh, partner media members around the world to work with them. So in Ireland, the Irish Times would be a yeah. partner. Um, the Guardian in the UK NRC would have been a partner. NRC in the Netherlands. Yeah, and, and there would have, there's different, there's different um, newspapers or, or news outlets, uh, whether they're online or newspapers or TV. It's, it's um, I think there's 74 different Different people certainly in in one of the one of the recent ones where we we looked at um, Kiva Robinson. This yeah. is uh, Daniel Kinhan's wife. Um, there was uh, Dubai unlocked. Uh, it was an investigation again. These were involved, but also the organised crime and corruption reporting project as well, mm-hmm. which is I think kind of works along with the ICIJ as well. Yeah. And they, they get a lot of of these kind of heavy data leaks where somebody hands over an entire server of you know, the regulator of real yeah. estate um, dealings in in uh, in somewhere like UAE or, as we know, the the, the, the famous Panama Papers, the firm um, Mossack Fonseca, who are going to come up in this particular yes. article as well. Exactly that. They they actually say here in their statement that they, the ICIJ relies entirely on donations to fund our work. We do not pay media partners, nor do they pay us for publishing our projects. Our donors are a rock stars. We would not exist without them. So, um, yeah, they're doing really worthwhile work. I just wanted to have a quick look at exactly what they are. And in actual fact, one of the journalists named on this story is Jan Mayas, who's a regular contributor here and he works um, for the Media House organisation. He's based in Amsterdam, a very good crime reporter. Um, now, this story is about Eden Tito Gassanen. And as you pointed out, we're the only English language when I did a quick Easy Google there, I was kind of thinking, all I was, getting, yeah, all I was getting was stuff that we've done. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, we are always interested in Eden Gassanen because he is the Bosnian sort of, uh, you know, the Balkan link to Daniel Kinahan. He's the fourth wheel of that European super cartel. Um, he's a very dark and sinister character, this guy. I mean, we've seen uh, Ridwan Taghi, uh, Raphael Imperiale, there's Eden Gassanen, and of course there's Daniel Kinahan. Now, and you have El Rico as well. Yes, he's sort Ricardo, of linked Rico to Taggy. Yeah. yeah, I could never quite understand: is he separate or is he linked to Taggy? They seem to be sort of somewhat. He's a supplier for Taggy's. Yeah, he's a Dutch operation. Chilean, was the way he's yeah. been described. But he was again. All the people you've just mentioned were all at the Kinahan Robinson wedding in the Burj Al Arab in yeah. 2017, which is, just seems to be coming up time and time again and all these stories that the ICIJ do as well. And that you've mentioned it, it was one observation I wanted to make. I'm going to let you handle a lot of the uh, economic, <laughs> sort of difficult economic stuff in this story. But one of the th- the points I noticed in this very long article was that that wedding, um, and it's the first time I've seen this properly, you know, we always talk about that it was been monitored, but we don't really know exactly who was monitoring it or up to now. But this article is saying that it was sort of a a mix of Sky ECC hack, DEA intelligent and the testimony from a Dutch witness who we do know is uh, Nabil B, who gave evidence against Rido and Taggy. He was the first to sort of say that um, there was this European super cartel. The DEA uh, needed proof apart from that. And this wedding obviously was happening around the time of the Sky ECC hack, which I didn't realise before, or else messages in relation to it have been um, hacked off that. Now, that was, that came after EncroChat Sky ECC. And we don't hear a huge amount about it here. I don't think um, a lot of the European and obviously a lot of the criminals based in Dubai were using that Sky ECC. Yeah, it's a Canadian server. Yeah. It was 2021. That's what I've noticed as when it was hacked. Um, so I think, I suppose they were going back in retrospect with the evidence they were getting from Nabil B, um, plus whatever the DEA had at the time, because we do know that the DEA had their own people there or they were watching or whatever it was, because yeah. that was contained in that report. If you remember, that was leaked via somewhere in Sarajevo that we got hold of that mm. caused a bit of a row here briefly when, when we ran with it here. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, it looks like they were they were able to kind of, I suppose, retrospectively put it together. And mm-hmm. don't forget now we've we have uh, Raphael Imperiali talking as well. Talking so, I mean, well, there's, a, yeah. there's a lot of information there. 
So is it, it was from him, the information was coming in relation to Sky ECC that Eden Gassinen was becoming quite paranoid on Sky ECC and, you know, three months before I think it was all blown, um, he was talking about setting up his actual own communications network so as they could be sure it was secure. So, you know, these criminal organizations are actually going to create their own telecommunication system. Um, and of course, our own, the Penguin, George <coughs> Mitchell was involved in in trying to establish one of those communication systems before it was also uncovered in a bunker in Germany. So anyway, back to this story. Gassinen and uh, this is a big eye opener about the UAE, isn't it? And and the, the, the tricky practices there. Well, it's it's... It's, 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 I suppose it's less of an eye opener for the likes of us because we've been banging away on this. The fact that Sean McGovern, you know, who there's a, a European arrest warrant out from in connection with murder in this country mm -hmm. and there's no sign of him being sent back. He's, he's a free man. But Eden Gassanen is a guy who has had convictions in Rotterdam for drug dealing. And then just, uh, I think in November 22, got another seven years for um, uh, organizing drug shipments, uh, cocaine from South America and precursor chemicals from China for amphetamines. And he, he basically did a deal where he'd, he'd, uh, he, he wouldn't contest evidence in return for a lesser sentence and got his seven years. And he was arrested by the authorities in the UAE. But um, they said, oh, there was a mistake with the paperwork and it was submitted too, too late after the 40 days had lapsed, which the Dutch um, prosecution have angrily, um, pretty, you know, fiercely denied, saying, no, we did everything on record. Mm. And the fact remains that Gassanen is is free to walk around in, in Dubai despite having this uh, sentence. Um and I think this and continues and, and continues to this uh, yeah. to, to the ICIJ. He's yeah. continuing to ship vast quantities of cocaine into Europe. Yeah, and I mean, and you have like the Kinnahans still there, like the three the three guys, and you have Sean McGovern, Bernard Clancy, Ian Dixon, all who were um, sanctioned by the US. I mean, presumably that they, they, they'll have trouble leaving um, uh, the UAE, or I mean, they're in Dubai, which is one of seven Emirates, I think, that make up the the, the UAE. Um, but this, I suppose that the article um, from the ICIJ was about the fact that Gassanen had been able to set up companies um, and one of them was in one of these free trade zones. It's called the DMCC, which I think stands for something like uh, Dubai Multi something something, each beginning with C. Sorry, I can't remember. Um, and, you know, the fact that, that he got one set up allowed him then to set up a, a whole string of various shell companies and he actually, he, he, he was basically, it was notarized by two Panamanian diplomats based in, in the UAE at the time, one of whom was the son of the founder of Mossack Fonseca, which is the law firm, which was at the heart of the Panama Papers, which showed like the whole international network where you had Russian oligarchs, drug dealers, you know, all sorts of top politicians, criminals. Uh, um, you know, f companies that were using these vehicles to hide money, to evade tax, avoid tax, um, to move, move, move stuff around. And what Gassanen then was using his company for was that he he actually had some of his his basically his gang members on the payroll. Yeah, you know, that's what I was going to ask you. That 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 was what I was kind of understanding from this article that he was basically creating these companies, um, then putting them in jobs and roles in these companies, so he was able to pay them through the legitimate economy. But these companies and a lot of work have been done by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. They don't seem to either exist or they certainly aren't doing what they're saying they're doing. So in other words, they're sort of fake. They're Yeah, fronts. they're just total shell companies. Yeah. And I mean, like the quote, and it's not even worth reading out, but the quote on online is just this garbled kind of uh, mission statement on a website or on, or sorry, on the papers that were filed about, you know, what this company was meant to do. And it's just gobbledygook. It's mm. rubbish. It's like somebody mixed up the AI and just threw out a word salad and filled in the form. So how does the guy from Panama end up in Dubai? Is there any well, well, of that? Well, this is, he, he was the consul, like he was the official, he was, a, he was um, part of the, of Panama's diplomatic network. Um, this is uh, Eduardo Fonseca Ward. Uh, his father, Ramon, uh, was the co-founder of, of the law firm at the center of the, the, the Panama Papers. He, he actually died of, of, um, pneumonia in hospital there. Um, but his mother, Elizabeth, she was actually the the ambassador to the Netherlands at one point for, for Panama. Now, Panama have been criticised, according to the ICIJ, in the past for it, it allowing the use of their diplomatic network to set up shell companies. Now, you, you also see the British Virgin Islands have a role to play in that. And, and one of their 
uh, top ranking guys in, in, in the BVI was recently jailed for shipping uh, cocaine or organizing shipments of cocaine to Miami via the British Virgin Islands. So I, I suppose some of these kind of tax havens that were always there for dark money have just, you know, em- really embraced the darkness to some extent if, if this is who they're doing business with. And of course, the British Virgin Islands that was mentioned earlier when um, Morrissey, uh, Johnny Morrissey, the Kinahan's money launderer, was setting up companies there in order to, to yeah. launder their funds. And and you kind of you wonder as well what's going on that his 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 wife um, Nicola Morrissey Nicola Morrissey who has thanks to Nicola for yeah just remember, there for a second why I remember that one <laughs> yeah no I mean she she's effectively in control of you know Nero Vodka or Nero Drinks the firm that was also sanctioned but she hasn't been sanctioned herself. Uh, you, you, you kind of you, you do wonder about how effective these are. Like we we know that we did the like we did the a version of the story ourselves in the Sunday World about the Dubai Unlocked project, mm. which focused on the real estate data that was leaked in Dubai, and there was a there was some uh, of Irish interest there, and one of them was Kiva Robinson and what she'd bought, and they were able to show that. Um, they were able to show that there was at least six properties they had bought after moving there in 2015, and that there was there was there was a small number of transactions went ahead after they had been sanctioned in in April 2022. Now, isn't it? Um, but like, I mean, some of these the figures were huge. I mean, there was the Emerald, the Emirates Hills development. It was bought for 6.05 million and sold for 11.7 the following year. So, I mean, that's a massive markup of five million in a year. So, you know, you make it wonder either property is, 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 you know, is soaring at an exponential rate there or it's a, it's a vehicle for, for funneling drug money through these, these property deals, which you'd have to kind of suggest that that might be the case when someone like, you know, Kiva Robinson's involved. She mightn't have any uh, convictions necessarily herself, but she's certainly literally in bed with, you know, mm-hmm. the biggest drug barons Ireland's ever produced. Um, there, there was others then, you know, like 5 million, 1 million ones. There was um, the likes of uh, Ian Dixon, I think it was, was was renting uh, an apartment as well for 3,000 a month. And it, it's just the fact that they're wanted by the US and there's $5 million on their head and yet these transactions are still going ahead. And even I think there was, there was stuff then as well, if you remember about their, their Google searches where where it came out as well and that there was a little bit of travel done and they were still like, you know, putting up restaurant reviews. So they were clearly it's moving just, around freely without any worries about being extradited. How do you tackle it when you have countries so corrupt that they're facilitating this and they're offering them? I mean, the UAE are going to be first to claim that they are trying to clean up their act, that they don't want these people living there. But it seems as if the whole country, the way it's set up, is purely to facilitate dirty money. It, it, it looks that way. And and to be honest, it looks like, you know, some of the Western countries aren't too um, worried about it either. If, if it, the very last paragraph in the yeah. ICIJ piece is about the fact that um, uh, that Dubai have been taken off the list of countries uh, at the, in, in danger of what's illicit money flows. Yeah. Um, and that it was very much at the insistence of, you know, uh, Germany and the United States and the United Kingdom were, were happy to kind of get these guys off the list. So obviously a deal was done. Well, it's the, it's the Global Financial Action Task Force list of countries at, at risk of illicit money flows yeah. at the request of Germany, the United States and other Western governments. So you've got drug traffickers still living there, funneling their money through, and no one seems to give a rat's arse about it. it. Is that to say that those countries didn't want them, didn't want them investigated or sort of red flagged? No, want it, the Emirates. It, they didn't want the Emirates yeah. um, to be to be kind of they they didn't want the the Emirates to be cut out of the international banking system because that's you know you know theoretically that's what could happen you know they'd they'd be kind of down there with with I don't know I suppose Russia and and North Korea so it'd be it would be too much too much of a, a financial um, hit I think for Western countries as well to take that there's so much money flowing through there mm-hmm. um, but yeah I mean the UAE don't really seem to have any interest there's, there's one of the um, if you remember Operation Desert Light yes, uh, I think that's when Gasolin was first arrested in November uh, uh, 2000 or two, yeah 22 and and that, again this was we know now this was part of the, the Canadian ECC sky hack uh, or EEC. What is it? ECC. 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 Mm. I know I used uh, to like, get mixed up with it as well. We, we know it was part of that hack um, and uh, those guys arrested. So, you, you know, they're still free walking around. And one of those, if you remember him, was um, he was part of or believed to be part of the Kinahan cartel stuff, uh, Ryan James Hale. 
uh, and, the, and there was the messages that were produced. He was were picked produced. up as part of Gassanin's network, but he was certainly very closely associated with Kinnahan. It's just sort of strengthening the links between the two. Yeah, and, and that was a 700 kilo of cocaine, consignment of cocaine in Valencia that this was based on. And this is what brought up, you know, he was known as Robo on, on the system. And then you had Anthony Alfredo Martinez Meza or Hassan. He, he, was, he was the kind of the guy working uh, from Dubai, but had the contacts in Panama that were getting the boats loaded. And then, and then Hale was, was part of that network then in, in Spain that were importing the drugs, but also laundering the money. And there was one of the one of the Spanish prosecutors, like you know, was quoted in in, in this article. Um, I think now in relation to a different uh, a different person at the rafter, El Tigre, Alejandro Salgada Vero. They were after him. They said, like you know, when it comes to court in Dubai, mm-hmm. everything gets complicated. The judicial process gets slowed down, and they ask for they ask for a lot of information. I thought that was a very interesting quote, all right. Yeah, and, that, then, and then it finishes off when we send them new documents, they don't respond. So yeah. it's like they're, they're, they're playing the game, but they're, they're, like playing they're playing a playing slow a game. game. Yeah, and I mean, you know, they're, they're certainly making it seriously difficult. They'll eventually will hand back some of these guys, but it seems to me the ones they want to. You know, that Gassanen was arrested, was due to be sent back to the Netherlands and the UAE claim that the Netherlands didn't provide them, provide them with the appropriate documentation by the 40 day cutoff point. The doors are open and he's allowed to walk out. I mean, this is somebody that has been accused by the US as being one of the world's top 50 drug dealers. Uh, the world's top 50 drug dealers. And they've described him as a threat to the regional stability and institutional trust in the Western Balkans because, of course, he's been... um, Prosecutors there say that he had sort of been infiltrating and paying off politicians, um, you know, and working with the the head of the state security services and by laundering money internationally. So he is actually, in a way... You know, if you take those leaders of that European super cartel, of which Daniel Kinahan is supposed to be the boss of bosses, and he is supposed to be the one sort of overseeing all of them. But if you take Ridwan Taghi, he took on the state of the Netherlands in a way that was absolutely terrifying from behind bars, suspected of being behind the murder of a state, um, the brother of a state witness, of a, a lawyer representing a state witness, and a journalist and uh, other acts of terrorism against the foundations of the Netherlands, the royal family were under protection. The Prime Minister Ruta was at one point um, having to be given protection because the, the taggy organisation were coming for him. Then you have Gassanen who is attempting to m- mooch in on what is a, you know, largely Bosnia and Herzegovina is a place that has a troubled past and history um, and is possibly corruptible certain areas of it. And he has been doing that. So he's taking on the foundations of the state there. And in a smaller way, maybe you had Daniel Kinahan with all that, pu- you know, propaganda he was putting out. He was trying to take on the foundations of the state here by accusing the media, the government um, and others in other in rival criminal ne- networks of joining together and working together to try and destabilize his operation. Like, how do those like minds come together? Raphael Imperiale almost seems clownish compared to the rest of them. He's only interested in making money. It's it's it is down to the money, and it's down to this huge flow of cocaine that's turning into money in Europe, and that it's it's just. There's so much of it. It's always going to have the power to corrode any society. I mean, they don't have to look far. Any episode of Narcos with, you know, in the early days of Pablo Escobar, which was a nickname for Gassanin, the Europeans Escobar. Yeah. You know, it, it was all about, you know, subverting the state. Um, you know, and of like, course, Escobar did take on the very, he took on the state and set himself. It's that mindset, is it? Yeah, it's, it's like, like you know, why, why should we... With reality yeah. or something. But it's, it's, it's like, why should we play by any rules? Like, we'll, we'll set the rules. Yeah. You know, so why, why should we be kind of constrained by, you know, small people in, you know, government offices who are elected by these idiots? Like, you know, it's called democracy. But, mm. you know, like, why should we have to listen to them? Why should they stop me making as much money? Let people do what they want. You know, you can, mm. it's, it's an, an extreme criminal version of libertarianism, I guess, if you want um, to kind of give it a, some kind of a, a, a label or whatever. But I mean, it's, it's hugely... Um, 
it's hu- it is hugely corrosive. It's interesting what you say about Imperiale being kind of the brutish gobshite, I suppose, mm-hmm. <laughs> compared to the rest of them. Because there's a piece in this article where they talk about um, the ninjas that the Colombian cartels could provide. So these are assassins that, you know, they, they can send to any part of the world and they can get them shot or stabbed, whatever you want. And these guys be paid. They'll even allow themselves to be caught. So, you know, they'll make it look like, you know, they're lone wolf or, you know, working by themselves when, once they get paid. Uh, and th- they were talking about, he, Imperiali told us, telling some of the people who've been interviewing him now, because we know he's turned state's evidence in, in, in India, that when the idea was floated with him of, of gang rivals being uh, stabbed to death, he thought it was crazy and that, and that everyone would be arrested. And more importantly, Daniel would be unhappy. So it was like this. But that's like, only in Dubai. They yeah. don't want people being killed in Dubai. They don't care where it happens. No, they don't the care the anywhere. World. Exactly. Yeah, because yeah. they, they they don't want to do it on their own doorstep. No. you know, and and they they have a roof there. So so long as they play by the Emiratis' rules or whoever is looking after them in Dubai, they're free to stay. And that's what it's down to. And you know, once the once the money is coming in and once mm. it's going into the right place, I mean, and that kind of gives you that quote from Imperiali, although albeit a lot of this stuff we're trying to translate and you can you can lose certain things in translation. But that is looking as if he's also suggesting that Daniel Kinahan is the boss of bosses. Yeah, it does. I mean, it's a, it's a telling quote. Yeah. And I mean, like, we, like I, I presume at some point at, at the Gardaí are going to be somewhere in the queue to interview Imperiale. I know there's kind of the Italians saying, well, we're doing them first. And then mm. I presume it's the, the Americans are going to be in second. The Dutch have been talking to them, have they? Yeah, well, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe we're going to get to see all this. And maybe, mm. you know, like one of our, our, our policing partners will ask questions on our behalf, as they do with the Encro Chat investigations, do all the prosecutions <laughs> on our behalf. Uh, probably being a bit unfair. But I mean, it, but at the same time, it, 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 it makes no odds so long as the UAE comp- continues to be this just black hole where, you know, information and money goes in and nothing comes out. Mm-hmm. I mean, even if you remember there, it was, it was just it was a couple of weeks ago, um, another one of these uh, Maroc Mafia guys was was um, got 15 years in the Netherlands. Um, and that, that, again, this was, and he was ordered to pay, I think, 8 million in assets. So this is uh, Hosne Ar- Adjare, okay, nicknamed Hitler. And he was sentenced in Belgium, as actually was. And that was, again, part of, of Desert Light, the, the whole arrest when James Hale and all the rest. And uh, But he he was virtually, he was unknown. Like, I mean, nobody really knew who he was until this broke. And that he's one of the biggest drug dealers who'd been shipping cocaine through the Belgian port of Antwerp. So that was his use, I suppose, to the mm-hmm. super cartel. Um, but the point is, they were, they were extremely violent. There, were, there was um, some of the messages they got, they got on, on, on the hack was photographs of a seriously injured Antwerp gang member. It was sent to other gang members. So this is a guy who fell foul. He made some cock up or whatever. And he was kidnapped, tortured and left for death. And this photograph of this guy was sent around as a warning to other gang members. Like, you know, don't don't fuck things up, mm. essentially, when, you, when, you, when you're dealing with us. And, you know, the other business partners they dealt with, they kidnapped, they, they, they took money off them. Like, they're, you know, they're... They, they were not nice people to work with, you know, mm-hmm. even if you were supposed to get paid. And the, the court in Belgium has ordered the immediate arrest, but there's no sign of him coming home either, like to face the music. Isn't it interesting, the background of these actual guys as well, those four really, um, and El Rico is there too. I think he's a partner, an equal partner to Rido and Taggy. While their grouping is the same, he is definitely, you know, the fifth, I suppose, head of this cartel. But all of them have backgrounds like Gasson and I hadn't known much about his background, but his family moved to the Netherlands, I think, actually. He's, he's yeah, and he, as a, as a young child, and he kind of grew up in the city of Breda and he had a, Breda, again, yeah. like uh, Radio and Taggy, had a coffee shop. But they so, fled the Balkans war, the family. They obviously yeah. came with nothing. It's, there's a very, there's very little information about how he ends up you know, in Peru, is it where he's doing yeah, deals? Yeah, and now he's suddenly doing deals in Peru, which is, you know. So how do you get to that point? How do you go from having a little coffee shop to there? Um, you know, you can see that similar. And he was born in 1982, um, which makes him 40. I'm going to let you work this one out. Oh God, don't <laughs> sort of feel like I'm so, I'm hanging in the wind here. He was born in 1982. So that's 42, 42. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds about right to me. It could be 43, <laughs> depending on what, what month he was born in. Okay, so he's 42. Yeah. So the, brain, the brain cogs yeah. are working slightly there. But um, so, you know, they're, they're sort of all in and around the same age group. 
they are coming of age at the turn of the century, really, um, when that big cocaine boom is starting, mm. when the economies of Europe and our own, et cetera, is, is, you know, they're rising. Young people have more and more money. It's a bit of a perfect storm and they seem to sort of converge then between the Netherlands and Spain. They're obviously doing a bit of business together. And by about 2014, 2015, and we can see it the same with Eaton Gasson, and they're really coming together. Um, but in their native countries, the murders have started, the, you know, the unraveling yeah. slightly of their organisations, all following the same path, aren't they? Because, of yeah, course, Kinnahan was unraveling from his friendship with Gary Hutch in and around that time. Yeah, but and don't forget Kinnahan Sr., you know, had been operating in in the Netherlands and in Belgium at mm-hmm. that at that stage. I think he still had a, a Dutch girlfriend, so he spoke various languages. Uh, he was based in the south of Spain at that stage as well. So, I mean, is it possible that he was the kind of the the the, the criminal guru that kind of uh, helped along these younger would be international crime lords at that stage, or did he have a role to play? Because well, it's funny enough, I've asked that a few times, and I've been told no, it was all Daniel that really sort of brought it together. But at the same time. Like Kinnahan Senior is a really peculiar, significant character. He's there in Dubai almost waiting for his sons when they move out in 2016. And they were still, of course, in Spain up to that point. So they move out. He's he's already laid the groundwork. He's settled in there. He's got the offices, you know, he's presumably identified the properties and started buying them up. He's moved himself into sort of more money laundering sort of well, we even kind of drug, knew, knew and, and drug we, route. Yeah, but we knew that from some of the stuff that came out around the time of Operation Shovel, which mm. was 2010, when he was arrested along with his two sons. And if you remember, then I know there was a lot of there was a, a kind of a deliberate bum steer given to the authorities. But you know, there was evidence that they were involved in commodity broking and shipping, you know, whatever it was, bananas and concrete from Ukraine and bananas from Ecuador and all the rest. And it was all being brokered through companies in Dubai. Yeah. And we know that at the time that at they're at that level, were. yeah. And and you had they had their various, um, their their various people they were connected to in business at that time. And we know now that he was, I think he was with uh, Kenneth Senior was with Yussi Neldrum back then mm-hmm. as well, who was an accomplished businesswoman in her own right, with lots of connections in the right places in her native Turkey, yeah. as, as well as uh, you know around the Middle East clearly as well. So I mean, they really were setting up mm. themselves. They always had that behind them. Like Daniel Kinnan had his, you know, registered company in Ireland when he was eighteen. Mm. Was it Black Curiosity or something Curiosity like that? Curiosity Yes, yeah, there was the the. the okay. It was supposed to be a, a an antiques business yeah. anyway. Like you know, so there, there was so they they always had that you know on the go. It wasn't something that was kind of it was new. I think mm. you know it was always going to be a move in. I mean, certainly in twenty ten like we were coming to the view that uh, the money laundering was as big as business as their as their drug business. But I suppose we're a little bit naive there. And well, the, the drug business yeah. has become so lucrative now. It's I mean, it's, it's it. they're probably I mean, equal partners. Those links to Dubai didn't mean anything to us probably in 2010 because they had, you know, there was c- countries all over the world that he had um, investments in or that were mentioned at the time, Cyprus and various other countries. But that 2014, 2015 time, there's violence. There's this, they're obviously coming together. They, are, they have a vision for the future. They are looking to in conjoining take over a third, possibly more, of the European cocaine market, the vast value of that. And there's violence starting. People are getting taken out. It's becoming very narco by 2014, 2015. And of course, in Ireland, then we had the 2016 incident at the Regency Hotel. The um, backlash to that by the Kinahan organisation was pure narco style. Nobody was going to be saved. Kill the whole family type of stuff. Kill everybody, yeah, it was, you know? it, Business went out the window and it was all about bloodlust and revenge. It was unreal. Um, and then you can see them migrate on to Dubai where they have got back to business, really. Yeah. You know, they and, and, and there are many of them have been sent back and are now behind bars. And of course, there is certainly confidence here that uh, with the Garda Sheikhona that Daniel Kinahan will be standing before the special criminal court in the in the near future, but um, you know it's all about business when it gets out to Dubai. It's all about uh, making more and more money and accumulating how much money 
hundreds and millions, a billion is thrown out at some stage. It's, all, it's always in the billions now at this stage. It's I like mean, take over the world stuff, isn't it? it? It's yeah, and I mean, like it's hardly newsworthy now if a cocaine seizure is mm. less than five hundred million. Like you know, it's sad to say. I mean, and if you flick on, I mean, I'm sure you're doing the same as me. We're we're looking at the the Dutch um, news and and Spanish newspapers, and you know. Every every at least every week, if not every two yeah. weeks, there, there's there's um, seizures in that in in that scale. Even though it, it's funny the way these things are shifting now, they're saying the likes of Antwerp and Rotterdam, the amount of drug seizures have seized. And okay, on one side, it's a success on the part of the authorities; they've made those ports too difficult. But they've moved on, and they're talking about the likes of Southampton, smaller ports. Um, you know that there's you know ports in Denmark, port, ports in in kind of uh, the east coast of Spain. Uh, you know, other places are going to be are going to be used. Uh, no more than, as we know, like, you know, Kenyon Senior tried to set up, you know, that whole East Africa, or, or sorry, West African route as well, using using the the medical yeah. emergency flights to to bring in cocaine from, from the coast to, you know, up to North Africa to be shipped into Europe from there. Mm. So, I mean, they're constantly looking at ways of doing it. And and, and the kind of the, the time you're talking about uh, as well, don't forget, the, in parallel, like in the producing countries like Colombia, mm. like you had FARC had, had basically gone out of the drug business, you know, as a political organization. They had, you know, the, they had a peace deal in, in Colombia. So there, there was a whole kind of... Um, fracturing of, I suppose, the hierarchy of the drug cartels in, in South America, as well with the success of the Americans in, in I suppose, cherry picking their, their, their cartel leaders to, 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 to jail or to, to, to get them on, on US soil to try them for crimes there and lock them up for the rest of their lives. So you had a lot of fracturing and splintering. Mm. So all of a sudden, uh, it became easier for, you know, the likes of Gassanin and presumably the Kinahans, to make contacts in South America and to start doing deals because they had the money. Mm. And I mean, like some of the stuff that um, Imperialis come out with now is saying they basically had, you know, 100 million in cash that they could literally wave around and saying, like, what do we get for this? So, you know, some of these small, you know, uh, you know, former cartel groups that were once together as part of a one powerful network, mm. suddenly they had a chance to get a leg up. They knew that the American market is pretty much, uh, you know, it's saturated to some extent. It's also, it's hard to break into that if you're not already there because they, it's controlled tightly. Mm. The Mexicans are, are kind of controlling the border there now. So all of a sudden you can now cut out the Mexicans and you could get your, you could sell your your, your stuff to, to, uh, to Europe, which you still had kind of burgeoning economies, you know, the likes of, you know, Poland as, a, as an economic powerhouse is really coming to the fore. So, I mean, it's a massive market and we're just, it's just going to keep rising. I mean, we know there's just, there's been record year on year uh, of, of cocaine seizures it and it's like going to continue. It's sort of a balloon and it's just been pumped and pumped and pumped with more and more air and it will, will it continue or will the drug market change? Will this sort of... Well, I mean, we can look to the States and I mean, like these things reach a peak and I mean, no more than, I mean, alcohol consumption in this country, I think the last time I looked, I think it's down 31% I'm really 20 years ago. I'm really surprised by that, I'm just going to say. Well, that's probably because just apart from me and you, <laughs> like, no, th look, there's, there's a bunch of us who are committed drinkers and we're, we're, we're doing our best to keep ourselves up in the global the rankings. The youngsters are well, so... The youngsters, a, a lot of the youngsters have no interest in, in pub culture. They have no interest in, in drinking a lot because they know that they're going to be photographed. They're going to be on Instagram. They're going to be on, you know, they're so... they want to do it themselves. I don't know if they're more sensible. Oh, I think like, they are. I think they're more health conscious. And well, maybe they're they're that. sick of looking at their mum and dad like lying on the sofa, <laughs> drooling on a Sunday morning, unable to speak because they're so hungover. I don't know. But I like, saw a it's been a change. the other day, and she was taking the piss out of teenagers, sort of the way they are like that, and just, <laughs> judging, like, judgy. You know, at our, you know, in my generation, we drank like it was a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were getting paid to do it. Yeah, but I suppose the, the point I was making, I, I think, is that, you know, cocaine uh, consumption will have a natural cycle at some yeah. point. That, you know, whatever it is, 8% of people have tried it or so on. And you, you might get to a point where you'll say, oh my God, 14% of people have tried it and it's hugely corrupting. We can't get a... You, you, you know, you, you can't do a, find a guarded division without a, you know, where there isn't a single member that doesn't test positive for, you know, for cocaine or something or a school yeah. where at least, you know, one in 20 teachers are, are, are turning up positive or whatever it is. I mean, and, and there will be a peak and there will be lots of, you know, moral scaring and getting people getting worried about it. I think but there will be a peak. There'll probably be a new drug. I mean, some of these synthetics that are coming out. So all of a sudden, you know, there's every chance that 
there's so many of them come out. One of them is actually going to get it right and it's going to be but the super But that's kind of what I think is probably going to take over, you know, and it's going to be easier to produce in, in home countries and all that. So, I mean, I don't know, like there's the age old argument of delegalize. I think we're so far away from legalizing anything here. I think we probably should be looking at legalizing cannabis in the same way it has been in other countries. Take back that portion of the market into the legitimate economy. Cocaine, I've always said, how the hell do you do that? You can't go out and deal with these drug cartels until somebody recently pointed out to me, and I think it was quite a point. Uh, yes, but you could go directly to the farmers and buy the coca leaves. Yeah. I mean, look, bring it in and make the cocaine. There, there would, there would be ways it. to do it. And I mean, mm. but there's, I think there's a lot of steps I think that would have to happen first. And you'd have to have the right level of addiction treatment in place. You yeah. have to, you'd have to have the right level, level of, of drug education. You'd do we have, have to that get for alcohol. If you're, if you're not really, no. I mean, the thing is, if you've private health insurance, you can, you can go through, um, treatments and all the rest of it again you know it's it's i suppose there is there is that element of a two-tier health system mm. i mean and it's it's probably why to some extent you, you don't hear of you know people from well-to-do backgrounds you know ending up on the street you know with drug addiction because you know there there is a support system there yeah there's family there that'll that'll hopefully hopefully intervene mm. uh, before they get to that point whereas people that you know uh, you know who come from less well-to-do backgrounds don't have that safety net and end up being this kind of visible yeah kind of end user of you know uh, of drugs that brings into this point i mean it's 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 terrible to see but like i mean, I mean that, I but that's a real crisis the the, sort of the homeless situation from your addiction um you know, sometimes when you talk to people working in addiction, um, they're talking about the mental health stuff that's going on, you know, the level of mental health problems that there are out there. Yeah, there's all of that, I think, would, would need to be in place. I mean, before you introduce more madness inducing uh, mm -hmm. elements to having a night out, I mean... Yeah, I mean, alcohol is probably still the biggest killer. I mean, you know, and, and even then, sometimes alcohol isn't down as the, the root cause that people say, oh, well, so-and-so suffered de depression when they took their own life. But you probably find that they did it when they were badly hung over or, or mm -hmm. you know, or had gone through, just come out of a long period of binge drinking or whatever. I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge killer. It's it's legal. There's still, like, there was still a big seizure of, uh, you know, illegally imported uh, alcohol in Ross Lair. I think just mm -hmm. last week it was 300 grand's worth. So, I mean, the problem with with having legalized drugs and uh, like a, and I'm not making this argument for or against. Mm. I'm kind of I'm open to hearing the arguments at the mm. minute. I mean, I I would have always had a kind of a liberal kind of view, you know. But you know, there, sh there should be some form of decriminalized version of drug use. Uh, at what point do you stop? But the point is, once you legalize it, you take away the moral hazard. You're going to have somebody then trying to undercut what's sold at the official prices. Like, how do you stop people selling it cheaper and cheaper? I mean, you have unit price alcohol, you know, uh, regulations in in Ireland now. Uh, supermarkets can't sell their beer cheaper just to get you in to mm. you, know, you know all of that stuff there's you, you, there's a price to be sold a black and market will still exist you yeah mean, and, yeah. and it's been hugely successful in in scotland it's particularly like the unit price it's really stopped you know some of some of the worst excesses that they, they had with i suppose some of the stronger beers that you know like there, there were certain types of of um six and seven and eight percent beers which don't tend to see them on the market in ireland and they were they were causing like serious issues where you could buy you know you could buy a half litre for less than a pound, this sort of stuff, you know, I can. And it was causing serious issues for a lot of people. Right. Uh, so, I mean, it, all of that would have to be brought in. You can say, like, how strong should the cannabis be? Yeah, like, exactly, you know, and, yeah. and uh, you go to these cannabis stores in the States, I'm told. And, you know, and you kind of, if, you're, if you go in there as a newbie and say, well, what would you like? And you say, well, you say, I don't know. I say, well, do you want to go faster or slower? Is, mm -hmm. is where to start. And then... You know, you know, you know, I mean, some of the stuff that that's sold on the street here, like the skunkweed is extremely, extremely mm -hmm. strong. And, and this is, you know. And then uh, those jellies as well. I think people don't understand yeah, it. Yeah, and, 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 and there's a. Kick in. Uh, yeah, and, and again, it's an unregu unregulated in terms of the way it's made. So you don't know. So, I mean, there's another argument for legalizing. If you're going to have, um, if you're going to use or you're going to buy kind of uh, cannabis jellies. You want you want you want to know how much of the active ingredient is in it. Like, are you buying a bottle of vodka or are you buying a can of beer? And that's what you need to know. Mm. And then sometimes, like some of these, it's cannabis like. You know, it's again a sea synthetics, and a lot of these haven't been tested properly. They haven't gone through proper, you, you know, trials to see like you you know will they cause psychiatric issues or will they cause memory loss or whatever blindness? God knows, you know. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, it's just something has to be better than this. What's going on at the moment seems total chaos. And I mean, this is only one window into a very big world where there's lots of other Eden Gassinans and Daniel Kinnahans yeah. operating. I, and I, they're I, not on our radar and they're from different parts of the world and we're not interested. Mm. This is just a small window to see how these kind of guys that, you know, went from street dealers to billionaires with a belief in themselves that they can actually destabilize entire nations. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a way of keeping... I, I suppose police forces busy in, you know, while they're in Dubai and police forces in your target market are too busy worrying about other things to inter interrupt your business. I mean, you know, it's it's the kind of the the modern entrepreneur's way to disrupt markets and disrupt the old models and do business their own way. And I mean, you, you call it chaos. They argue, no, it's not. This is perfectly organized. We, oh, know, yeah. we know exactly what we're doing. Like, oh, and we yeah. kind of see and, it as it's chaos do. at the point where our world kind of interfaces with their world. And it kind of gives the, it certainly gives the impression of chaos if you have heads being left in buckets like happened in, in, in Holland. But it's chaos for ordered society that all of this money is being poured into trying to police this problem that they're in a country which seems to be giving them protection and they are literally playing games like, you know, um, they're able to work the systems. And I always find it, you know, you have to stand back sometimes, um, you know, and admire the way they're able to work the systems, the way they're able to move themselves up in society. So they're actually rubbing shoulders with people in charge of nations. I mean, <laughs> yeah, money talks, and it really is. It, it just comes down to it. It's, it's money talks, and I mean, and and that's what we know. Gasolin was trying to do. There was a whole series of arrests there earlier this year, and you know he's funding election campaigns. Like they, there was one of the things they read, they were surprised how many young athletes seem to have been taken in. And again, we saw that parallel, of course, with Kinhen and yeah. the boxers, mm -hmm. and a way of legitimizing your, your existence, and, and not to mention probably a very effective way of launching your money as well. For sure, for sure. Right. Well, thanks to the ICIJ for all the work on that story. And um, they could put us on the list for the data dumps as well. We'd really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, we would. We must ourselves. get in touch with them because we do a lot of stuff around their work. And uh, there is an Irish guy there uh, that you recognize um, who worked in Australia. So we might just reach out to him, Fergus Shield, the managing editor. Um, <laughs> we always like to go to the <laughs> Irish, don't we? Well, it's a starting point. It's always a starting point. Brilliant. Thanks, Eamon. It's always a pleasure, Nicola. I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.